today we will be doing a review of the Hyperlite Mountain Gear HMG Ultra Mid 4. I have had the tent now in use a bit over three years and I calculated that I have spent alone or with someone over 60 nights in it during this time. Also I borrowed it to my brother for a week so it has had plenty of use now. First things first, the tent is not cheap. It's over a thousand euros. I'll get into the how I use it by myself later. But yeah, let's go through the basics of the tent. So first you can see now it's in the open configuration. The door can be opened quite wide. The footprint of the tent is basically square and it is a center pole conical tent, like a pyramid. So one pole in the middle. The pole does not come with the tent. You can buy it separately or it is totally possible to use two sets of hiking poles, paddles, sticks or any pole type piece of wood or here. Alternatively, it is possible to hang it from a tree branch. Here we have a loop. I have done it. It works as well. It gives actually a bit more space for indoors. This is how I use it most often. So one side of the front pegged into the ground and the other side is the entrance. You can switch the side by changing this guy line to the other other side so it's not something you can do with frozen fingers in a second or two it takes a minute maybe you have to make a new knot over there it's not difficult to do but just something to consider of course we can close the door there is like a zipper park up here which is nice and if you want to you can open it also from the top like that to have a bit more ventilation or take a look out outside. Or also works if you put this in the snow. Bury it a bit. All right, the height is adjustable. At the moment, I have quite a bit of clearance to the ground, like five to 10 centimeters. Depends on the length of the pole. These skylines come pre-attached. So there's uh, eight of them. Then uh, there is a, at least when I bought it, I got a bundle of uncut skyline. Not this one, it was similar to that, but I used it for something else. And I, instead I use this reflective guy line now, so I don't stumble on the guy lines so much. Also, I made this added the tightening. These, I think, cam cleats or something. These are, these are also re like reflective or self-illuminating. Other ends have loops and some of them have mini carabiners. These are adjustable. Often it's possible to use the vegetation for attaching, but also I carry a selection of different kinds of bags which do not come with the tent. So I have a set of different types for different grounds. So there is six attachment points on, at the ground level. It is very quick to set up, even alone, because everything you need, absolutely need are the four corners. And you don't need to erect it. You can just set the square shape first from the corner so it's flat. And then when the corners are in, you could put the mid points in as well, if the ground is soft or you are not certain of the pegs. But if, like here, the ground is good for pegging or you can tie it to roots or something, then four is enough. Then you just go in, close the zipper behind you and erect the pole, put the pole inside or tie it to a branch from the outside. Yeah, after that you can add more pegs. If the weather is very bad, I also use these mid-panel attachment points. But I don't tend to put them up, use them unless I have to, because at least one of them is already a bit broken due to the fact that I tripped <laughs> on the guy line and it pulled out a bit. So also I now I made a system here. Oh yeah, this one I have repaired a bit. Now I can also take them off if I need to with this toggle. I could easily tie them to the trees here if the weather turns bad to that bush or that tree behind me. If everything is attached, it is very stable. Very, very stable. Only thing is you need to put it low enough so that wind cannot get underneath. But anyway, like there is like usually at least 15 centimeters on top of the ground where the wind is not that bad. Or you can use the bush or vegetation or rocks to hide yourself a bit. But yeah, you can also lower it. Then it just doesn't ventilate as much. well. The fabric is Dyneema Composite DCF. It is robust enough when it's un under tensile tension, like from wind. This pyramid conical shape, it's very used traditionally here in Finland. They're kota tents, which are conical. It's very good for wind and also for snow loads. Snow will flow down and wind will just push it down. As long as no, no wind can get underneath tent fabric. About ventilation. 
yeah, you can get ventilation from underneath. And also on both sides, on the sides, we have these vents, which cannot be closed or adjusted in any way I can figure out. In the front and in the back, there are no vents, but you just I showed you, you can open the zipper from the top as well. The ventilation is good, but it's also a bit of a problem sometimes because if there is very heavy wind-driven rain, it actually goes upwards along the material of the tent and into the vent. This has happened a couple of times, but it requires heavy winds. But yeah, I do tend to put it sideways to the wind because I sleep on the back side and I don't want the fabric to be pressed against on that side. And the front we have the door and I want it to be a bit sheltered from the wind when I go in and out. So yeah, basically these vents go into the wind. Well, it can be fixed or <laughs> there is a solution. I can just hang something, piece of fabric, my jacket on the inside to block the water coming in. And it's not much, but yeah, that's something to take a note of. I would not think of this as a four-person tent. Three persons, I would say optimum two, like a couple. Two and the care, this would be good. But yeah, not for four, only in an emergency. Well, yeah, in a bad, like, real situation, you could actually probably sit here like six or even more people out of the wind. And this is light enough that you could actually carry it in winter as like a backup tent or a day trip tent that could be used like a kitchen or utility tent, shed for gear, sleds, or maybe a toilet tent, if you uh, want a fancy toilet. Sometimes it, it would be very nice. Yeah, I would not take this as, as the main tent in winter in up here in the Arctic. Maybe southern Finland where we have forest cover. Here in the tree line where I am right now, the trees end like, I don't know, 50 meters or 100 meters up in the elevation. Not higher than this. Even here, it can get very, very windy in the winter. Anyways, in heavy wind, it tends to stay. It just depends on how well you bake it down, how well you put the, the bags in. So snow bags, you can tie it to skis, whatever. Actually, most tents fail because of user error. But I have noticed most often, it says that the pegging is bad, one corner comes off and then the wind can get in and rip it out or let it flap. So if it's not tight enough, that's usually the cause of failure. Another point that can happen and has happened, when we, especially when we used the hiking poles and the straps to attach them together, in heavy wind this starts to bend and shake. Well, that's easy to fix if you have some rope or string and more sticks, even a camera tripod, something to tie in the middle to prevent it from buckling. So now we uh, take a look inside. I have bought it. You have to purchase it separately. The half insert. There is also a full insert available and uh, that works nicely for one person. It's like a luxus, a lot of room for my, me and my gear. And it works for two persons if they are close. I mean, a couple. Perfect. If they. <laughs> Uh, don't need a lot of personal space, but for example me and my brother only in an emergency I would say you of course it's not mandatory to use the inner part You don't need to buy it if you have no problems with bugs Then you can just sleep on the ground have a, a lightweight ground sheet and just sleep there That way you could put four people in there, which is very much an emergency thing Yeah about the insert the floor is Dyneema no holes so far three years of use the attachment I changed. They used to. Ah, there it still is there. There's like a cup like this that is supposed to go on. The pole is supposed to go in here, and this is up at the top here. But I, yeah, after the first or second use, I just stopped using it, and I put one tiny little carabiner up there, and I just clip the elastic cords there. The corners attached also with similar elastics. Four of them. Each corner has one. The back corners require a bit of crawling back there. And it is not easy to attach with one hand only. You can do it, but it's a bit fiddly. So I might DIY something to make it more convenient at some point. One more thing about the inner. It has the chip. The chipper is here. It is two-way chipper, but it only goes only up on the one side. The bottom goes to the other corner, but there is, you have to take this into account when cooking, doing stuff. So only one side. For two persons, again, it would be more convenient if there was also 
if the chipper made like a U shape all the way here. A bit heavier, yes, I admit that. But anyway, the inner is not that lightweight compared to the tent. Not at all. So what I did on some trips when I wanted to go lightweight, but anyway, I had a windproof tent in the summer, but over above the tree line in Lapland, in the Arctic. So what I used, I have a Sea to Summit Nano mosquito net. Yeah, I just used the nano mosquito netting, which is less than 100 grams, and hang it from there. Tyvex sheet is like, I don't know, another 100 grams, maybe 150. Yeah, then you can imagine by the shape of this, like a half a pyramid, uh, the person who is sleeping at the back will get the netting touching them. So if they are just bare skin against that, then the mosquitoes can and they will bite you through the netting. So there is not that much space. But anyways, I have been quite happy with it, with these limitations in mind. Oh yeah, one thing about the tent. The pole doesn't need to be straight. It can, of course, be aligned, uh, put on an angle. It just needs to be longer on the side. So that it would make a bit more space indoors. But now that I'm alone, it, there's no need for that. Alright, then. Some things I have noticed. Up here at the cone, the taping of the seams is coming off. I contacted HMG about this and yeah, they sent me repair tape, which I applied and it worked for a while. But now that is coming off, the repair tape of the use. But to be honest, I have not really noticed it to be a really a problem. It doesn't really leak from up there as it water doesn't pool over there. It's just the seams of the cone. So yeah, I'm not unhappy about that at all. I understand that it is very difficult place because there is a lot of tension on the fabric at exactly that area. So not really a problem. Then nothing has failed due to the construction or materials of the tent as such. Due to my own lack of thinking, I have had some problems. Like I told you about one of the mid-panel attachments. I had to sew back on because I tripped on the line. These I added, these mini carabiners, because originally I ran the, just the guy line through the loop here, but the guy line acted like a saw after a while and it ate into this loop halfway in. So when I noticed that I got the mini carabiners and I yeah repaired the damage there. Now it works fine. Of course, I could just have a line and tie it there statically so that it doesn't run and make a knot at the other end. But often when I want to make a camp, I want everything to be as easy as possible to set up. If your fingers are frozen, as they often are up here, I don't want to start fiddling with knots. So yeah, this adjustment system works very well now. Okay, what else? Yes, as I told you, the Dyneema is, has very high tensile strength, but puncture resistance is very low. So when it's tightened under tension, it's very easy to poke holes into it. And this is what I did down here, where I have made some repairs with the Dyneema repair tape for, from H&G. And this repair has worked very well. I was wearing very heavy material gaiters over my boots, and they have like a tightening strap. It is plastic hard, the, the, the one that goes under the heel, that part, and there was an extra poking to the side, and this poked through the hem here. It doesn't matter at all, I just fix it with the tape. But yeah, just keep in mind, this does not like poking. Why I had so, such gators is because of snakes. We were in Tasmania and Australia. On other failures, nothing so far. So, as I said in the beginning, it's not for everyone. It is lightweight. You need to take care of it, no, no poking, and it is expensive. Because you have to buy everything extra, like the bags, the inner tent. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I use it for? I use it for uh, summer trips to Lapland, like this, where weather can get bad, and I am above the tree line from time to time. So I have to be prepared for bad weather, but not extremely bad during the summer. For winter, I use tunnel tents, mostly Hilleberg. Uh, in the wooded areas, I use a Kota, the traditional Finnish conical tent, DP kind. And of course, backrafting. Backrafting, this gives a lot of space. I can put my raft in. 
I could imagine if you had like a bicycle or something, you could park it in there. If you do fishing, photographing, something else like this. This has a lot of parking space inside. The tent has a large footprint, yes, but you don't need to care. You can have stones, tree stumps, stuff inside. You can even use them as a table if you are clever. So with some luck and some imagination, you can actually use the terrain as there is no attached uh, floor. And you can use the half insert, half inner on the other one of the sides. It doesn't need to be at the back. It can also go to the side. I don't suggest putting it into the front because <laughs> obvious reasons. And yeah, anyways, there's plenty of space usually. If I was traveling in, let's say, Japan or some like very places where you have a lot of, you have designated campsites and a lot of people where you need as minimum tent as possible, then this is not your choice. That said, we still use this in Tasmania, Australia on the very popular hike, the Overland Track, which does have designated campsites. Well, okay, there's also uh, wild camping possibilities that we did. But yeah, the campsites are, have like platforms and they still fit on them. So, not bad. It is not freestanding, and but anyways, I do not see much need for freestanding tent anyways, except for kayaking in the archipelago of Finland or such places where you have just rocks or high up in the mountains where you have bare rock that you cannot peg it in. You, can, you should still attach it to the ground somehow, even a freestanding tent, what happens when you go to the toilet and it's not attached? So you can use the rocks to tie it. This is what I very often do. Or wedge something in between, like cracks in the rock. Yeah, tie it to your gear, uh, dig it into snow and so on. So yeah, so far I have found it quite useful. Also, yeah, for travel. Mm -hmm. It's not absolutely super ultralight, to be honest. Especially with the insert. It is quite lightweight when combined with uh, <clears throat> mosquito netting the, from sea to summit or something similar. One thing also, it's a good thing and a bad thing, is that the tent gets very hot in the sun. It's like a greenhouse, really. It gets hotter than you <laughs> would imagine. And uh, I can imagine on a springtime ski trip, this would be very nice to get warm. But if you want to sleep in late, here especially in the north where the sun gets up, quite early in the morning. You, sometimes it doesn't go down at all, actually, during the summer. So you might get very sweaty and early wake up. I actually, in Australia, I re had to rig a space blanket, like a mylar blanket, as a reflector. I put it inside because it was windy. Put it inside uh, the tent to reflect at least some of the heat off. I was starting to get worried that it heats it so much that the glue of the seam tape starts to melt because it was really getting hot. But no damage due to that, luckily. How I might want to modify the tent in the future, I have been looking into adding a stove jack and using a very minimum ultralight titanium stove inside. Lighter and smaller than the one I already have to use it to burn sticks and stuff. Last night when I arrived here there was heavy rain and less than 10 degrees Celsius and wind from the north and yeah I was wet all the way into my underwear. I came over the lake with the back raft. First I hiked in to the lake from the other side and then rafted in and yes I, it would have been very nice to have a warm tent then. I could make a fire, I could have made a fire, but I would have needed a tarp to get out of the rain. So I would need to carry a tarp for that anyways, if I want to really utilize the fire. But I could have the small stick <laughs> stove and a stove jack. So I will look into that at some point. I have to figure out where exactly to put it. The manufacturer does not recommend this in any way. They don't even recommend cooking inside, well, you can, everyone can make their own decisions about that. I, of course, cook inside tents. And considering how much I have used it now, and I still plan to use it for many years, overall, I'm quite happy with the tent. The Hyperlite Mountain Gear Ultimate 4 